Um, yes, I am uh, Dr. Henry's husband. So <laughs> anybody who deals with uh, Dr. Henry uh, should thank me specifically because <laughs> I make her lunch, <laughs> make sure her car works, I plow the road. What do I do? What else do I do? Take care of the child. And take care of the loop. Take care of the loop. Take care of my son. <laughs> so she makes it to clinic, not often on time, but she does make it. Maybe <laughs> because of me. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 well. <laughs> okay, so yeah, as it's already been stated, I am Caleb Henry. I am a lawyer at Johnston Ming Manning. It's a firm in Red Deer. We uh, practice all sorts of kinds of law. Uh, I primarily practice wills and estates um, and corporate commercial law. And I will sue the odd person here or there, so uh, be careful what you say to me. <laughs> uh, just, just kidding. Um, and I wrote this in my notes, so I better say it. I have a farm, farming background, so I do come from a farm in Alex. So uh, agricultural matters are important to me. My family still farms, so I, I head out there and get stuff done with my dad. And, uh, so I do know where uh, you guys come from if you come from a farming background. Um, quick disclaimer. Oh, we haven't. Okay, yeah. Have we done a disclaimer? We haven't done a disclaimer yet? Well, we have a disclaimer. We're good. Here's the disclaimer. Um, basically, I'm a lawyer. I'll tell you just this is legal information. This is information itself. None of this is advice, so don't take it as such and uh, apply it to your lives. This is just for your information. Um, next slide, please. Okay, this is what I've been tasked to do tonight, is to teach you guys, or at least tell you guys a little bit about broken relationships and dying without a will. Um, some really uh, interesting stuff there. Um, broken relationships, so let's go to the next slide, please. So, spouse, children's spouses, court orders and agreements. So I'm going to just ramble on a little bit, but I'm not going to bore you too much, so I'm going to try and keep this as simple as possible. Generally, this is what I tell my clients. There is a major event in your life, anything whatsoever, specifically in this case, spouses, former spouses, so you separate or you divorce. Change, at least consult your, your, your lawyer, and you need to change your will. It's important, because guess what? Likely, the person that you're separated from is the beneficiary and the executor of your current will. Okay, let's think about that a little bit. So, if you're separated and you die while you're separated, what happens to all your assets? Go goes to your ex spouse. That's a problem, unless you're super generous. That is a problem. <laughs> we can all agree with that. Um, so, best way to mitigate that lie. Is change your will. Just go see your lawyer, preferably go see your lawyer and change your will. Okay? Um, I threw this in the children's spouses. Um, it's not enter entirely important, but it is something to note. So when you estate plan, especially if you have large assets, so a house, uh, specifically farming assets, and you want to will it to somebody like your child, and they're married to a jerk. You gotta think about those things. Okay, it's very important to think about those things. Um, one way to sort of mitigate that risk is to have a prenup sign. I know that doesn't really go well with couples, but uh, I've seen it done. And in most couples, once you explain to them that, hey, mom and dad want to gift you the farm, but they're uncertain about the son and law, those sorts of things, they seem to handle it okay. So a prenup is one of those things that you can do to mitigate. So think about this, the, the, the spouses of your children. And there's a mom. <laughs> uh, so court orders and agreements. Um, these are important when you're estate planning. So court orders are court orders. So the court will often award spousal support, child support to somebody. Um, and if in your will, you say you give to your child your house, but in the court order it says it's actually supposed to go to your ex-wife. Uh, that's a problem. That's a big problem. And it's not going to fly. Agreements, so prenuptial agreements, postnuptial agreements, so before marriage, after marriage. 
cohabitation agreements and separation agreements, all those agreements have to be run consistently through well. So if you come and see me and we're doing your estate planning, I'm going to ask for all those agreements. And you guys are going to get offended because it happens every time. Oh, it's all fine. It's all good. It's all well, not necessarily. It's got to be consistent. Otherwise, your will will not be valid. And that's a problem. It's a problem for me and my insurance. So um, next slide, please. <laughs> okay, this is um, this is what I really want to talk about. The other stuff was really interesting to me, but it is something that's important for everybody to know. Dying without a will. That's a problem. That's a very big problem. Um, intestacy, this word, uh, it just means without a will or something like that. It just that's all it means. So don't get thrown off when words thrown around intestate or intestacy or anything like that. Those are weird terms. It just means without a will. Costly and stressful. People never believe me when I say that. It is true. If you don't have a will, it's costly and stressful at the end of the day. Not for you, you're dead. It doesn't matter. But for the beneficiaries and the person who's um, instructing me on what to do. And then, of course, I get stressed out. I have a particular will. That, so <laughs> we're trying to avoid it. So I'm going to just quickly, I don't know how much time is doing, but I have. Um, one point to make about the whole costly and stressful thing. Why is it costly and stressful? When you die without a will, what happens? Things become very uncertain. Uncertainty produces problems. Problems are the lawyer's best friends. So, we stay busy, costs go up. That's a problem to the estate. How do you avoid that? Is to insert certainty. So how do you insert certainty? Let's think about have a will. It's as simple as that. Okay. I have a I have a client right now. Actually, he's he's gone. He's dead. But um, he died in a tragic uh, construction accident. He left two kids, two kids, just young, just young, of course, two kids from two different moms. Okay, that's interesting. Um, and he died with uh, a long-time girlfriend. So his long-time girlfriend survived him. So he had that. And then we found out, oh, he had a wife in his home country. Then we found out he had another wife in his home country. And, but the second one was fraudulent. So I was like, okay, that's easy. We get that out of the way. But the question was, and he died without a will. So the question was, well, who's the beneficiary? Who's giving me directions to clean this mess up? But right now it's the dad, because we don't know what the heck's going on. So that's the problem. Like, if he had a will, we would know exactly where things are going. And we would know who to talk to. It's really important to have a will. Now, you're probably thinking, oh, Caleb, I don't have two wives, and I, and I don't have multiple girlfriends, and you know, all that. Uh, it's like, okay, fair enough, fair enough. That is kind of complicated. Okay. Well, I have a client. Um, I always have a client, I guess. But I have a client who, um, she's quite elderly. Um, her husband died Christmas Eve, of course. Why not? Um, died Christmas Eve and uh, suddenly died without a will. Okay, well that shouldn't be, that should be hard. Everything should go to the spouse. You think, wow, <sighs> he had bank accounts that she knew about, but he never put her on, on, on the bank account itself. Now the bank sees her and they go, well, who the heck are you? I'm, I'm the surviving wife. Really? I want a letter from the lawyer. Now suddenly something that seemed to be so simple became super yeah. complicated. Yeah. And it would have been nice had there been a will. Yeah. Uh, farming assets. Okay, I have two pet peeves. I have multiple, by the way. I have multiple <laughs> pet peeves. <laughs> but I have two pet peeves in relation to this. One, dying without a will. That's number one. Number two, dying with a will. That is an irrelevant will, and it's not good for a So let me explain. I had a client. Um, farmer client, uh, husband and wife, they died in a car accident, both of them died. They had a will, so I was like, yes, let me look at the will. 20 years old, okay, well, that can't be that bad. Yes, it is that bad, because the executors are dead, and uh, named on the will. And the children are now grown up, and they're in their thirties. Okay, let's add some more facts to this mix. They're farmers, 2,000 acres. Okay, it's a decent sized farm. 
Um, one son, three kids, one son, two sons, one daughter, two kids, Edmonton, Calgary, one son, running the farm. With that, dad promises them, you're gonna get the farm son, you're gonna get the farm son. Well, the will says, take all the assets, sell, split three. Now what? What do we do? I would have rather have no will for crying out loud. Like it's such a pain in the butt at that point. Because guess what? Edmonton and Calgary's children, what do they want? What does the son want who's working on the farm? So what do we do? Maybe. Guess what? I'm, I'm a very rich man because of it. Those are the sorts of things that you guys need to consider. The goal is, is to not make lawyers happy. Have a will. Have a will. Because yeah. those sort of disputes, yeah. those sort of disputes really make our business flourish. Avoid those disputes. Spend a little money on a will. Okay, let's, let's move on a little bit. Uh, next slide, please. Cecil Harris Estate. Now, this is really I couldn't wait to get to this slide because I, I love this story. Horrible story, but I love it. Um, it's the Cecil Harris Estate. You guys don't care what that means, it doesn't matter. It's a really interesting fact pattern, and it is Canada's most famous case, by far. In fact, American students in law school, they study it all the time, because it is a really weird one. Um, so old poor Cecil, farmer, Rosetown, Saskatchewan. Cool, okay. He goes out plowing one night, he tells his wife, I will be back at sunset. It's 1948, cabin's dropped, massive. He goes out, doesn't come back at sunset. Wife goes, well, what the heck? Asks the neighbor to go out and find him. Neighbor goes out and finds him underneath the tractor. Oh, shoot, that really hurts. Uh, he was pinned under the tractor for hours. They don't actually know how he got pinned, and they still, even to this day, they, they try to explain it, they don't really know how, but he got pinned underneath the tractor. So, like any good old farmer would do, he started scratching in the fender. He needed a will. Because back then there was no rights for surviving spouses and all those sorts of things, especially in Saskatchewan. And so what they did was uh, it was important to have a will to transfer all the assets. He didn't have a will. So he, what he wrote in the assets, in fact, advise you, don't do this at home. <laughs> Just get a will. He wrote, in case I die in this mess, I leave everything to the wife. And then he, he actually signed his name. Cecil Geo Harris. He's been on the side of things. He even did handwriting for crying out loud. Like, that's pretty decent. I would have just been like scratching my head. But that, that's what he did. Um, and then look over here. He's got his knife on it. So it's, it's, in, it's in the display. So that display, they held it at the University of Saskatchewan Law School uh, since 48. So it's, it's pretty neat little route. Um, so the lawyer actually removed the fender from the tractor and took it to the court probate. And the court granted it. Um, so that's why it's studied so well. It's, it's, it's quite an amazing case. So what does it teach us? Next slide. See a lawyer. That's what that case teaches you. See a lawyer. It's worth it. Am I? Um, these are little slogans I came up with, so I don't know. They're kind of keeping this. So pay now, save later, plan now, peace later. And it's true. It, it is kind of true. Um, now, I want to say something. I will speak. I guess I can't speak for these guys as well. Only one underdressed, so I shouldn't be able to say this. Um, is uh, we all know this. Death is very certain. <laughs> it is certain for all of us, unfortunately. Um, but it is what it is. Um, and even though death is super certain, it is uh, it brings a lot of uncertainty. A lot. Uh, not for you, you're dead. But it brings a lot of uncertainty for the survivors and for the beneficiaries. Um, they're really, really lost and trying to figure out what's happening. And what's worse is if, if you don't have a will to bring a little certainty in that mess, um, uh, it just causes more problems. Um, so our goal here, I think, is to bring a little certainty in your guys' life. Um, you guys will feel at peace once the estate plan is done. Um, trust me on that. Um, and if you don't, your sense will. And I can guarantee you that uh, because I see it all, all the time.
Okay, so that is my presentation. Thank you for listening to that battle. Now I'll pass it on to Stephanie. How are you enjoying the evening today? Good. So far, so good. Yes. Yeah. Just uh, just let your neighbor just tell them I'm enjoying my time. Are you? <laughs> okay. One person listens. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, I'm just going <laughs> to I'm just going to talk a little bit about the city plan. Uh, the two topics that oftentimes people have struggled with that we see in our, in our office is the personal representative is trying to figure out and navigating um, the process of uh, dealing with an estate. And then we'll also just touch on the option when it comes to an estate. Go ahead, next slide. So uh, a couple of things, role of personal representative duties and personal representative uh, providing support, taking a closer look at your investments by passing the probate. Okay, next. So what is a personal representative? What is a personal representative? It is actually an executor or an executrix, um, but here in Alberta, we call them personal representatives. And their job is, they can be, they can be a person or a trust company, depending on the size of the estate. They can be a trustee of the deceased estate. Uh, they have no responsibility or authority over assets bypassing uh, estate. Hold on. They have no responsibility over the assets uh, they're bypassing the estate. So their main job is just to take care of what's happening in the estate. And then they obtain a grant probate from the court after talking with Caleb. Uh, they don't have any uh, power or authority until the deceased actually passes away. So how long does a personal representative spend on this on average? Well, you can see it right here. This is it right here. 570 hours on effort. And it's the goal, it's called an executor's year. So they have about a year to complete this all. Um, so you can imagine the panic that sets in when suddenly someone is, finds out that they've been honored with the role of a, a personal representative. So I'm talking to you, the testators, because all of you guys will write a will, and this will be important for you, because you also might also be a, a personal representative. Now, executor's year, complete the estate administration within one year of granted probate. Uh, part of your job can be funeral arrangements, uh, arranged service, disposition, obtain a death certificate, special arrangements, so you would talk with the funeral home, and then keep a dated log of tasks, expenses, and funeral bur burial wishes in the will that are carried out. So, here's a little note. Don't put the will, I would caution, I would, consider, I would recommend that you don't put the will at the bank, in the security box. Put it in maybe a vault, go buy yourself a little vault, put all your personal belongings in there, uh, share that information with a couple loved ones, especially your personal representative, so that everyone knows what would happen if you were to pass away. That way, your wishes can be carried out. Okay? Next. Responsibilities. Uh, I'm going to fly through this, because I don't want you to, bore, to be bored, but what I did was I put this on your table so you can go ahead and look at it and uh, make little notes alongside them. So, okay, locate the original last will, that's important. You don't want an outdated will, okay, we'll make sure of that. Determine the complexity of the will. So maybe you need to talk to the lawyer and talk about how complex this will is, and if you need some extra help for that. Collect information and documentation, including the deceased's um, full legal name, family other beneficiaries, professional advisors, and personal agreements. So you're going to gather the documents. Go ahead, next slide. 
The deceased assets and liabilities, so physical assets, real estate, vehicles, financial statements, that's in their investments, bank accounts, and debt. Uh, safety deposit box and key, private company shares, and some of that stuff's not easy to access. Um, we were working on one case and it was, uh, it was a little bit of a nightmare trying to just get basic information from one of the private companies. Uh, Loyalty points, online travel shopping accounts, photos, of social media accounts. Safeguard all assets uh, and materials. Safekeeping of valuables, so redirect mail, collect and deposit checks, make periodic payments, cancel credit cards, cancel subscriptions, arrange interim management for business, real estate change logs, notify insurance on vacancy. So you can see where we're getting with 570 hours. Do you want to be a personal representative? <laughs> if you want to have, someone's got to be your personal representative. That's the long and short of it, but you can help them. So we're going to talk about that in a few moments. Back up just a second. Um, when it comes to your role as the personal representative is to secure the assets. So what that means is it's probably recommended if there's a house. Uh, we just had this, one of our clients need to do this, where they had to go in, they changed all the locks. Why would you have to go change all the locks? A couple reasons. Um, there's some not great people out there that look through the obituaries and then they target these type, these homes where they might have easy access to burglarize the place. The other reason is the family who's who was promised an heirloom and they know the code or they have a key. And so they go in there and they help themselves. Now you can't claim insurance on that because it was legal access. But you are liable for that as the representative. So change the locks, notify insurer vacancy. <coughs> Apply for death benefits, uh, CPP, uh, employment, employment, pension, life insurance, annuity. Just a quick pause. When you go to the funeral home, make sure that they fill out the paperwork to send off to the government. That will help with some of that paperwork. So that's going to be really helpful. Transmit uh, title to all the state assets, usually to the executor or trustee, rarely directly to the beneficiary. Obtain accounting from the attorney. And so that would be the power of attorney. You probably want to get all their records because the estate would maybe need to act on that. File for probing with the lawyer and then hire one. Please hire one. If you need a bookkeeper to help you, hire a bookkeeper. If you need uh, to talk to a lawyer or, um, well, of course you need to talk to a lawyer, but get the accountant in there as soon as possible. And get the help because it's not an easy job. Identify and contact beneficiaries. It becomes a little more tougher when we have the beneficiaries and the beneficiaries are asking, I just heard the reading of the will and you owe me money, so come on. And there's a lot of emotion that can be tied up to the role of the executive or the personal representative. So contact third parties, apply for the death benefits, CPP, employment, pension, or so we went through that. Obtain, uh, pay all deceased personal debts. Uh, so this would be the debts and taxes. Pay all deceased personal debts and estate tax. Advertise for creditors. Yes, you do need to advertise for creditors. You gotta put it out there for a little while and let people know that they can make a claim against the estate if they are uh, a valid creditor. File personal and estate income tax returns. So this is when you would talk to Jared. Uh, you should engage that conversation earlier, though. Don't leave it to the last minute. If required, and obtain clearance certificates. Wait for the resolution of any dependents for lien claims. Remain neutral and accept to support the will. Next. Uh, okay, so just a little note. Upon death, a Canadian resident is deemed to have disposed of all their worldwide property receive proceeds equal to FMV as the date of death. What does FMV stand for? Can anyone? Fair market value. Yes, fair market value. So 
Uh, it's not at what it was when they purchased it, but it was at the price when they, when, every, when a person passed away. So if that grew, there's going to be a tax liability. Okay, next. Distribute specific gifts unless the state is insolvent. Prepare accounting for residuary beneficiaries. Obtain release from uh, residuary beneficiaries or court and distribute this state residue. Next. So, that is a snapshot of the role of an executor or personal representative. If you've been through this, you know that this is just a snapshot. Um, I've had the privilege of working with, with clients and just walking them through this and uh, just being a, a support in that regards. The role of the personal representative is a fiduciary one. So what does that mean? It means you're named a fiduciary and accept the role. You must, by law, manage the person's money and property for their benefit, not yours. Um, in a fair and equal manner, and you're liable to loss if it's not manageable. Smile. Next. <laughs> okay. So we get, get through all that. The reason why I went through all that is not to bore you to death, but to emphasize your point. How can you help a personal representative? Do something for them. Do something for your legacy. Organize your documents. Put them into one place. Let them know that they are the personal representative. I've got to say that again. Let them know that they are the personal representative. We were coming out of an age where, you know, it was private. Everything was private. Who we voted for was private. How we handled our finances were private. And for some, in some ways, that was good. But in other ways, like this, that's not good. We're not saying go tell, talk, go talk to everyone about your finances, but we are saying let the person know that they're your personal representative and then help them. Don't just tell them, yes, it's an honor, but it's a huge responsibility. Familiarize them with where you are so far. It's okay if you haven't got everything done because maybe they're going to be able to help you. Familiarize them with where you're at with your will. Maybe you don't have a will yet. Okay, start including them. Your formal estate plan, your financial plan. Interesting research uh, coming from Manlife State of Estate Planning Survey 2021. Only 13% of people called to have all three of these things done. So, get a move on, folks. Next. Selecting the right representative. So how can we tell what a good representative is? Well, make sure that they have enough time to devote to the estate administration. Okay? Are they willing? Are they able? And are they patient? Do they have integrity? Are they going to be someone who's actually going to work together with the family? <clears throat> Financially administrative inclined? Are they familiar with the deceased's affairs? Are they a resident of the same province? as the deceased. And we do highly recommend that they be a Canadian citizen. You can run into some massive tax issues if they're not. So what that means is don't have Bob, your cousin, who stays in the VW by the river, uh, be your personal representative. Just FYI. All right, next slide. So we actually work with uh, clients, and you'll notice on the first page there, we work with testators, helping them develop an estate plan, um, personal representative, so we can actually do a standing point with our personal representatives, and every single week, we'll just stand, we'll help them out. We won't do it for them, as we don't want to put ourselves in that position of lawsuit, but we will guide them through the process and support them along the way, and we found that it helps move the process a lot faster, and because of my youth pastoring background, I also got a big heart, so I, I care about people. So it's, it's a nice balance. Uh, we work with trustees as well, helping them manage the estate affairs um, and manage the, the 
funds, and then the beneficiaries when it comes to new money and how do you deal with this new family loan. Next slide. So really quickly, choosing the right investment. I'm just going to file through this so I can give Jared more than three minutes. Mayor? So part of the estate planning is ensuring your investments go as seamless, efficient, and quickly as possible to your beneficiaries. Would you all agree? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So one of the challenges is with probate is when something is probated, it's tied up for killed, what do you say, probably six, 12 months? Uh, depends on the estate, but if, it's, if there's a will, everybody's in Alberta, so sometimes it can take a little longer. <laughs> but yes, okay. the new electronic application, it's like two weeks. Yeah. But if there's no will and it gets complicated, yeah. Because yeah. we're working on one right now that's probably three, three years. About three years. Um, so even with the new newer methods, there's a possibility that things can start can still take a long time. Um, so all assets and testator's name are probated. The would include the investments, bank accounts, other personal properties. So your GICs, non-registered accounts would also be probated. Uh, next. So some people are concerned about not only the length of time, but also just sometimes the public knowledge. So they don't always want the financial details to be exposed. Uh, public nature has potential to promote conflict among loved ones. So, next, estates can be challenged by creditors, uh, which can delay the wealth transfer and sometimes diminish diminish what's in the estate for the residual beneficiaries. Okay, next, so what's one of the solutions? Uh, segregated fund contract you can use. Go ahead, next. It's like mutual funds, uh, invest in diversified portfolio, professionally managed, wide range to choose from, but it's got an addition. So it's a state planning benefit. It will help protect your transfer of wealth. And because you can name a beneficiary, it will bypass the probate and go directly to your beneficiary in about two weeks. It's timely, private, cost effective. And some people order like this, it's creditor protected too. Um, so, next slide. So how can this help your estate plan? This is just one tool out of a lot of tools that can be used, but I thought this would be worth mentioning. So it allows for your wealth to continue to build, provides for beneficiaries seamlessly, can be used to privately compensate your executor. So not so typically what happens is the executor or the personal representative will be compensated. However, the other beneficiaries are also going to see that they're being compensated. And the personal representative probably should be compensated after spending 570 hours on there, but there might be a better way to keep family unity. And it could look like this, where you just privately, while you're passing, um, have them pay for that. Uh, back one slide, and can be used to distribute money over a period of time that you specify as well. All right. So estate plans can help provide tax efficiency, family harmony, speed, control, peace of mind. And if you want to learn more about that or you have questions, uh, come see me afterwards. Now, without any further ado, please put your hands together for Jared Paloma. Accountant and podcast host. Thank you very much. Warm introductions, Captain. Uh, thank you everyone for coming out this evening. I really appreciate you guys taking some time out of your busy schedules to spend a little bit of time with us. As Stephen said, my name is Jerry Bolan. I'm a partner with Legacy Tax. Offices in Red Deer, Troshu, and Gidsbury. We work with a lot of small, medium sized businesses, ad clients, and a whole lot of farming 215s as well. So it keeps us busy come March and April. 
So we are here to talk tax. Does anyone here enjoy sending tax dollars to Trudeau? <laughs> I certainly know. <laughs> I do not. <laughs> so I think I'm in the right business yeah. to uh, send people to taxes. So this is kind of what we're going to chat about real quick. Um, we have a whole lot of time left here, so I'm going to make this as physically possible. So calculating tax upon passing, I just want to give you a quick overview of some of the income sources that you might see on a final tax return. I think a lot of people have a good grasp of this, but there are a few areas that definitely go unnoticed and can create a lot of problems for people. How to minimize tax on passing. So just kind of look at a, a few known and unknown strategies that you can put into place to minimize tax on passing. Um, looking at some strategies that have been traditionally used to maybe mitigate taxes, um, whether it's an estate freeze, those types of things, and then kind of touch on some quick legislation that's come up that has made certain tax planning options not very useful anymore. And then kind of lastly, looking at ways to plan for that tax. What can you put in place to you know, ensure that your beneficiaries are best prepared to deal with that tax liability? And then most notably, and I think the biggest thing that I think you should take away from this evening, is consulting that expert early and often. If you leave these items, any one of these three issues to the very end, whether it's a will, planning to get that personal representative in place, or planning for that final tax liability, you're going to run yourself and your beneficiaries into the issues. And I think to me, the biggest thing with estate planning, yes, it's important to pay tax, it's important to have a proper plan in place, but for me, it's always preserving the legacy of your family, ensuring those relationships are protected long after you pass, because that is what ultimately lives on. You know, your money will come and go, but preserving those relationships is what you should truly focus on. Next slide. So these are the various sources of income that you're probably going to see on a terminal tax return. Um, as far as regular income goes, wages, business income, rental income, things of that nature, that's going to be fairly self-explanatory. As Stephen mentioned, when you pass away, everything is going to be reported on your tax return at fair market value. So if you have rental properties, farm properties, shares in corporations, things of that nature, you need to take steps to plan for that accordingly. Rental properties always bring up an additional issue. If you're claiming depreciation on that over the course of time, that is going to come back as income to you on your final tax return. So it's important to plan for that because that could be a fairly large income inclusion at that point in time. Personal use property, usually not a major thing. Typically, if you buy that car and you let it sit in the driveway for 30 years, it's not going to have any capital value when you pass. But you might want to look at your stamp collections, your book collections, things of that nature. Take steps to, to plan for those disposals. And then lastly, the one that I find seems to be the biggest struggle for clients that come into our office is the balances in your RSP or your RIF accounts. And I think a lot of people kind of get it in their head that you know, you put this into the account, it's for retirement, you know, you didn't pay tax on it back then, maybe it's not taxable when you pass away, but the entire fair market value of that RSP or that RIF is going to come into income at 100% inclusion. And if you've got 300000 in stock away in an RSP or a RIF, you're looking at 50% tax on that. So you need to take steps to plan ahead to mitigate that tax. Next slide. So biggest concerns with uh, tax liabilities on passing. So like I just mentioned, large portions of your income can be included in those high brackets. So if you're not planning ahead for 48%, you know, your estate could be left with a huge bill that they may not be interested in sending out if you don't. Uh, estate may not have sufficient liquid assets. So this is a big one for small business owners. If the majority of your wealth is tied up in that small business, it might translate into some fairly significant tax dollars, and your estate might not have a way to pay you that tax. They are then going to be left with a very difficult decision for having to sell off that business in order to pay that tax liability. Part of your legacy is probably keeping that business on, keeping that farm going, 
ensuring these things pass on to the next generation. And I'm presuming you would hate to see that have to be broken up just to pay a tax liability. And then lastly, unequal payment of terminal tax liabilities. So what happens with those RSPs, these RIF accounts, you can set those up with direct beneficiaries. It works great with other things such as probate, but it can create issues. If you're transferring those funds directly to one child to the exclusion of another, the estate is then responsible for all the tax on that RSP, but one child might get a bigger portion of that estate than the other. So you need to kind of keep these things in mind to ensure that you're always protecting that legacy going forward. Next slide. So I'm just going to touch real quickly on ways that you can kind of minimize tax on passing. So one of them being multiple returns. So they have what is called a rights or things return. So if you have some income that is maybe due to you upon passing, but you didn't receive until after you passed, you can get your personal representative to talk to your accountant and say, we could possibly use tax, two tax returns in this scenario. You can make use of the marginal tax rates on a couple of returns and lower that overall tax burden. Graduated rate of states, so this is a very important one. Like Stephen mentioned, you kind of have that first year to get a lot of these things into place. So you want your personal representative to get the estate flowing within that first year. If there's assets within there, you probably want to get those sold off. And by getting some of these things put into this graduated rate estate, you have access to the marginal tax rates. You get access to that for 36 months after the date of death. So it's important to have your will in place. Have it in a place where everybody can find it so you can take the steps to move the estate along as quickly as possible, not turn that 570 hours into 2,000 hours, and waste all of these tax funding opportunities. Next slide. So on to this one. So as an estate, and they have slightly changed some of these rules recently, but you do get some access to some additional charitable options. Traditionally, you can only use 75% of your income to deduct donations against. In the year of passing, you're able to use 100% of that. So if you've gone through life donating to a certain church, charity group, other organization, maybe in your final return via your will, you want to set out a final gift, a legacy to a particular church or whatever the case might be, and then you can use that to your full advantage as far as the tax goes. The $10,000 death benefit, so traditionally this kind of applies in the employment situation where you've got a pension in place and your employer can note a $10,000 benefit that will come to you tax free on your passing. If you operate a small business corp, I don't see any issue with talking to Caleb, putting a resolution in your minute book that says, upon my passing, I would like to see the corporation pay up $10,000 to my estate tax free. So simple things like this that you can do ahead of time to take advantage of some of these things. Whereas if you leave it to the very end, you're not going to be able to put this resolution in place and take advantage of it. Uh, real quick on this, so capital losses, traditionally you can only apply against capital gains. In the year of death, you get some extra kind of options to use them. You can apply them against regular income. In the estate, you're able to carry those back a year. So again, it boils down to the fact that you need to be prepared to be able to take advantage of these things. If the estate lapses beyond that first year, you're going to lose out on some of these planning opportunities. So keeping good tax records, ensuring you have all these things that your personal representative can take into that account is going to streamline the process and make it available to uh, your estate to Next slide. So like I kind of mentioned before, RSPs and RIPs, traditionally, if you have the husband and wife, spouse, common-law situation, that's going to roll from one spouse to the other on a tax-deferred basis. So you've got some grace there to deal with that through tax liability. There are some very strict guidelines in place where you can move that balance to a child. Traditionally, that involves the courts, 
we kind of defer from that option because it gets to be a bit messy. There's certain things that you might want to consider though in dealing with this direct transfer. You know, maybe you want to take some income into account depending on your data passing. Maybe you want to bring in the RSP balance and not defer it. So there's always these things that you need to be taking into consideration, bringing all the details into the account to ensure that you can get the best tax plan, best tax uh, deductions for yourself. Um, onto the spousal RSPs. So we've kind of quickly talked about this. Typically, you know, you're going to have anything transferring to a spouse either at the adjustment cost base or the fair market value. You don't get to kind of pick and choose in between those. So you need to have good you know, records as far as some of the, the details on the cost basis of these things to ensure that you're able to get them into the tax return in an efficient way. Lastly, on this one, just looking at that principal residence exemption. So the majority of people here are well aware of that. You sell a house, it's the only property that you have, you're currently living in, you're going to get a tax exemption there. If you do have a second property, you know, a family cottage, something to that effect, you're going to want to, again, kind of keep some good records on that to ensure that your accountant can take in the entire ownership period there to ensure that you're using that exemption to its maximum. So how to minimize tax on passing. So this is going to apply to business owners out there. Lifetime gap capital gains exemption currently at $971,000. Anything as far as farming property, you've got a million bucks there. Big important factor to remember here is to keep your business quote unquote clean for CRA's purpose. So you can't be stocking up huge investment account balances in there, excess cash balances. You need to take steps to kind of move some of those assets out of that operating company to make sure you are able to make use of these exemptions upon your passing. It's important to keep up to date because we all know death can unfortunately come at any point in time. So leaving this type of planning until the very end might put you offside on some of these. And then lastly, the uh, holding company. So like I kind of mentioned before, everything's going to be disposed of at fair market value. If you're not cleaning up some of the assets in that holding company within that first year, your estate could be subject to double taxation when they start taking some of those assets out of that holding company. So again, important to have everything in place to ensure you can make sure the process speeds along. <coughs> so quickly here, these are a little bit more, I guess, in-depth strategies. So if you're getting to the point in life where the business is ready to pass on to the next generation, maybe you've got some kids that are willing to take over, you've got some employees that are interested, whatever the case might be, maybe an estate freeze is something for you. You freeze the value of your corporation at that point in time. You can determine what your eventual tax liability is. Maybe you speak to step in, you get some life insurance put into place to cover up that liability. It provides that certainty that Caleb was mentioning before. A testamentary trust, something again that can be set up through the will, that gives you some options to move your property after you have passed. Maybe it protects some minor beneficiaries. Maybe it protects certain individuals that might be spendthrifts and might blow through an inheritance. And it also gives some options for some family income split. And then lastly, this one, joint ownership. I know this comes up a lot with individuals that come in. You know, mom and dad come in, should I put my kids on the title? You know, it'll help us avoid probate. It will make things go easier. Traditionally, I think this has been kind of the go-to for a lot of lawyers. I think traditionally, we've kind of advised that that was a, a reasonable strategy to take. There have been some recent changes to legislation that now will require you to file a trust return in this particular situation, as well as a return that is called an underused housing tax return. So it is important to not just take this planning and do it in a silo and say, 
I put my kid on title, this is going to help you for estate planning purposes, because you might have opened up this huge you know, bell, ball of wax, ball of worms, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> and uh, created a lot of problems for yourself that you didn't intend to see. <clears throat> so lastly, on this slide here, planning for your tax liability on class. So do you have sufficient assets? You know, if you are disposing of a business in excess of that lifetime capital gains exemption, do you have some free cash available for your beneficiaries to pay that tax? Do you own a vacation property or a business? You know, maybe you've got a property that's been in the family for you know, decades and decades. It's the old family cabin up in the mountains and you want to keep that, but it's accrued significantly in value. Maybe that's the only significant asset you have on passive. If you don't set things in motion to protect your estate, you may have to liquidate that in order to pay that tax bill. And then lastly, is life insurance an option? Again, with all of this, the planning early and often is always going to be beneficial. If you're waiting until you are in your mid-80s to go get a life insurance policy to cover off your business tax liability, it might be a bit difficult to do that. Put that life insurance in place while I have, have this conversation on a regular basis. Adjust it if you need be, and make sure you're kind of taking care of that state. So lastly, I just want to mention consulting an expert. It doesn't matter if you come to us, if you guys go to your individual you know, accountants, tax advisors, lawyers, whatever the case is, I strongly encourage you to go speak with an expert on a regular basis. Don't wait until one of these major life events comes around to take on these discussions. And like we said before, like Brandon mentioned, you know, death is going to come eventually, so we might as well take the steps to plan for it ahead of time, protect our legacy, protect our kids, you know, our beneficiaries, and uh, make sure that you know that legacy that you want to leave is being preserved in that manner. Next slide. So again, Jared with Legacy Tax, feel free to touch base with us on our already Shrewshoe and Dinsbury. And uh, I think I will bring Brenda up for a quick QA. Hope you enjoyed that special episode of the Tax Talk podcast and that live footage from our recent estate planning seminar. If you have any comments or questions, feel free to reach out to me, jared at legacytax.ca, and I would be happy to discuss your estate planning questions with you to ensure you leave a strong legacy in place for your family. Take care.